But please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We pray, O oh God, that your name would be hallowed, revered, seen to be holy, set apart and glorious in the highest heavens as we gather together as Christ's blood-bought people. We pray that your name would be hallowed in our lives, in our singing praise to you, in our preaching, in our reading of the word, in our partaking of the sacraments. We pray that in all things, O oh Lord, that you would be glorified, that you would get glory, the very glory which we long for, which satisfies our souls. Lord, it's an amazing thing that we can even be here in your presence. And I pray that we would marvel at that. That the God who is holy, holy, holy. The God who dwells in unapproachable glory light. The God who should crush sinners. The God who loves righteousness and hates iniquity, hates darkness. You have invited us into your presence. We who are sinners, we who are dust, made of dust, and because of sin to dust we will return. We are in the presence of the most holy God. And that should blow our minds, O oh God. And how can it be? How can it be that we as fallen, sinful men and women and children, how can it be that we are in your presence, but by your unspeakable grace? Grace seen in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, who stands before you as our great high priest with his sacrifice always before you, with our names written on his chest in such a way that through him and because of our union with him, you look upon us with fatherly love and care and favor. And we worship you for that, Lord, that we who should perish have been saved by the blood of the Lamb, and that we have been united to this Lamb by the Spirit whom you have sent. Cause us to marvel, cause us to worship, and do far more in this service, Lord, than all that we can think or imagine, all by your grace, and for your glory, and for our joy, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, starting this morning, we're going to take a short break from our systematic exposition of the book of Hebrews, which is the kind of preaching that I think should be normative in the life of a healthy church. But we're going to take a break from that for a little while, and I want to preach some topical sermons on what is called ecclesiology, or simply put, the church, the ecclesia, the study of the ecclesia, the church. And the reason I want to do this is because I think these sermons are very necessary for our congregation, for where we are, for what we want to do, for the plans that we have, for the, the things that are on my front burner and your front burner, I hope. And the reason that these things are necessary, these sermons, it's not just because they are biblical, which makes them necessary and important at all times, but it is because our church has come to the place where we must make decisions. We must think about our future. We must think about what we are doing. And so therefore, I want to preach messages that are very relevant to the life of our church, uh, not just general messages that are relevant to our church and every church all the time. And so over the last few months, I have emailed and I have announced uh, really our need for receiving and installing another elder so that our church can be more biblical, so that it can be a healthier church, heading in a healthy direction. And now that we are getting closer to this reality, I think, and now that I have, through email and through announcements from the front of the church and, and have had personal conversations with you, after I have done all of that, and in all of that, recommending a candidate who aspires to the office of elder in this church, a candidate who needs to be called by us as a church through our vote. Because of all of this, I want to preach a sermon today on what elders are and why the church needs them. And in fact, it's not going to be a sermon on elders. 
standalone, but it's going to set the, the context. And I'm going to end with elders and why we need them and what they are. And then next week, I'm going to spend an entire sermon on the office of elder alone. So that's where we're going. So today I want to set the trajectory and I want to give us the building blocks for why we even need to talk about elders. And the reason I need to start somewhere else other than elders is because the moment that you begin talking about elders, you have to talk about something else. The Bible talks about something else, and we must talk about something else when the, when the topic of elders comes up. And what is that except the church? And so therefore, before we start with elders, we really have to start with what the church is and where elders fit into the church and how that works. And when we start there with what the church is, it, it actually ends up being not as simple as we like to think when we talk about the church. For example, in Voss's Dogmatics, volume 5, page 13, Voss, Voss asks the question, is it easy to give a definition of the church? And Voss, one of my heroes, answers, no. And then he continues by saying, for as the matter is considered for differing viewpoints, or from differing viewpoints, the definition will come out differently. The concept of the church is many-sided. And so therefore, to understand elders and where they are in relationship to the church, we actually have to start with the multifaceted nature of the church. And then we have to see how elders fit into this multifaceted nature of the church. And then, lest we walk away with the misunderstanding that the church has as its head fallen yet regenerate men, called a pastor or elders, with all power and authority, or in worst cases, a single popish man with what seems to be all power and authority of the church. We have to make it clear, moving from the church to elders, who the head of the church is, namely Christ and not fallen men. And so you can see how all of these individual parts, elders, the church, Christ, they cannot function alone. And the moment that you start talking about one, you must eventually bring in the other parts. They're all close at hand. But these are not the only things that I want to cover in these standalone sermons, these topical sermons that are relevant to the life of our church. Because also, as I have mentioned during the announcements for over a year now, I have been teaching through the Westminster Confession of Faith in Sunday school. And I have made it clear from the front of the church every week and at different times, more specifically, that I am doing this for a purpose. And the purpose of doing that is to bring this confession into the body of this church as its confessional standard regarding doctrine and practice. So there's a reason for why I am teaching through that, and I have said that numerous times. And so I want to address, in this series of topical sermons on the church and ecclesiology, why a confessional standard is important in the life of a church. And if you think about it for about three seconds, you realize that there must be some kind of standard, otherwise everyone and their brother can take the Bible and run with it however they please. So there must be a confessional standard that collectively interprets and summarizes and puts before us an understanding of the completed scriptures so that we are, even as elders and pastors, held accountable, not just generically to the Bible, which is meaningless, but to a confessional standard that we will not go against. And that's not it. That's not all. The other issue when we talk about the church and ecclesiology is where do our children fit into the church? How do we view our children in light of the church and the multifaceted nature and definition of the church? And what I have come to see over the last four years or so is that our children do belong to the visible body of Christ 
And therefore, because they do belong to the visible body of Christ, they should be baptized, which is the seal of belonging. Calvin says that baptism is an initiatory rite into the body of Christ, into the visible body of Christ. And therefore, if our children belong to the body of Christ, and if they always have belonged to the body of Christ, as I will show us, then they should receive the sign of belonging like they always have. And so I want to preach a sermon on that and why I think our children, even from birth, should be baptized. And one of the reasons that this is on my front burner is because I am unashamedly convicted and convinced that my fourth child should be baptized now. Not in 12 years, not in 10 years, but right now. Because she belongs to the body of Christ. She belongs to the covenant people of God. And the sign of belonging to the covenant people of God is the sign of the covenant, which is baptism. And I have said this numerous times. I've written on it. I brought it up in a series that I preached long ago on the covenant family, preaching from 1 Corinthians 7.14. And my goal is, is that our church, after hearing a defense of this from the pulpit, will, even if you disagree with it, see it as a historically reformed biblical reality that has been a part of the church since its beginning. And so I want us to see that from the pulpit. And the reason... The reason that I am going to do all of this from the pulpit, and quite frankly, I'd rather do it in a smaller group setting where you can ask questions like Sunday school. But in my experience, what I know about churches in general and our church is that this is the only place where I am going to get the majority of our people, the majority of our time. And so therefore, I must tackle these issues in this place on Sunday morning. So that's what I'm going to be doing. And I hope that you will, even if you disagree, hear me out, listen. And I want you to understand, by the time that I'm done with all of this, especially the baptism issue, that if anyone is the oddball in light of Christian history and baptism, it's not the Reformed Church which has baptized its infants always. But it is us. Those of us who have refused to do it. So that's what I'm doing over the next few months. And these topical sermons all related to the church, the ecclesia, which is what we call ecclesiology. So this morning, though, what I want to do is I want to begin our discussion regarding elders. And to do that, as I said, I have to begin with the church. And so this message is titled The Church, Her Lord and Her Leaders. So what I want to do this morning is essentially unpack those three things. I want to define the church, which is more nuanced than we often think. Then I want to make clear who rules over the church with absolute authority and power. And then third, I want to introduce the idea of elders, the men through whom Christ, who is Lord, shepherds and protects and builds up his church. And then next week, I will devote an entire sermon to the office of elder as it is described in Scripture. So we begin with this. What is the church? And I want to answer that question by first looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. And this is what it says. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Now, the first thing I want us to notice as we look at this text is how much Paul actually teaches about the church, the ecclesia, in this verse. And first notice that Paul, when he says church, ecclesia, he says church of God. And what does this do? It makes it crystal clear to us as God's people that this group of people, this 
ecclesia, these called out ones, this gathering, this assembly, they are congregated and assembled in relationship to God, making this a distinctly religious group, meaning it's not a social gathering. It is not a political party or the like. It is distinctly religious. It is a called out group of people existing in relationship to God and from God as those who belong to God. And even more, this religious group of people, depending on how you interpret the word here, we are not just vaguely related to God, but Paul says that we are specifically sanctified. And I take that here to mean set apart visibly from the world in Christ Jesus. Making the church a distinct entity that is related not vaguely to God, which is meaningless. Who is God? Is Allah God? God of who? No, it's not generic. But we are in relationship to God who is Yahweh in and through our relationship to Christ, set apart from the world, meaning the church is a distinct entity, a distinct reality that is centered around the person and work of Christ, which is summarized in the gospel, and in that way we are set apart unto God. Burkhoff says the church consists of those who are partakers of Christ and of the blessings of salvation that are in him that is Christ. And where in the text is this Christ-oriented, sanctified group of people who are visibly set apart unto God in and through Christ? Where are they? To the church of God that is in Corinth. So now we have the church, the ecclesia, the gathering around God in and through Christ in a certain location, a certain place called Corinth. But then Paul quickly makes it clear that the church is not exclusively in Corinth, but he goes on to teach us that the church in Corinth is one visible expression of a church, those that call upon the name of the Lord who is Christ, a gathering of people and a group of people who do that, who exists in every place. Which means that now our definition of the church is expanding. It's not just Corinth anymore. It is a church. And you can call a certain group of Christians, those sanctified in Christ Jesus, in Corinth, a church. But at the same time, we can call those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord, the church as well. And even though they are distinct, a particular church in Corinth, they are still united to the church that is in every place. And thus we begin to make distinctions between what we call and what systematic theologians call the local and the global or the universal church. Or as the Apostles' Creed calls it, the holy Catholic, Catholicus, meaning universal, not Roman Catholic, The holy universal church, meaning the church that is in every place. So now we have two working definitions of what the ecclesia of God is. We have particular churches in particular places. But then we have those who call upon the name of the Lord in every place. Meaning the church is bigger than one city or one gathering of people. But there is more. When we read the scriptures, we quickly learn that not all who belong to the local church or even the professing global church in every place actually belong to the Lord. They appear to belong to the Lord. It seems maybe even like for a time they belong to the Lord, but then maybe in the future it proves that they did not ever belong to the Lord, even though they belong to the visible gathering of God's people. For example... 1 Corinthians 5, it appears that we have a man who belongs to this visible particular congregation in Corinth, and yet he should not belong as a covenant member of the body. 
1 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 1, Paul says it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife. It's probably his mother-in-law. And you are arrogant, Paul says. Ought you not rather to mourn? And listen to what Paul says. It's so offensive to American culture. Let him who has done this be removed from among you. And who is the you here? The you is the church. The you is the congregation at Corinth, the church of God at Corinth, those sanctified in Christ, called to be holy, holy ones, saints, set apart ones who have professed to believe in Christ and his work. And this man who belongs to this physical and visible gathering of the people of God, according to the fruit of his life, does not appear to belong truly to those who are united by faith to Christ. And what is the solution according to Paul? He is to be excommunicated. He is to be cut off. He is to be cast out. Later in the chapter, Paul will quote Deuteronomy and say, purge the evil that is among you. This public, heinous sin deserves discipline. And Paul says that discipline is cut him off. Cut him off from the visible, physical gathering of God's people as a covenant member. Because he does not truly belong. And what does this teach us? It teaches us that not only can we make local and global distinctions when we talk about the church, the church in Corinth and the church in every place, but now we can make distinctions between those who truly belong to the Messiah by faith and those who only appear to belong, but maybe for a season or in the end, prove themselves to not belong even though both kinds of people can exist in the physical gathering of God's people for a time. So what is that? Well, let me give you one more example before I define it. 1 John 2.19. The Apostle John says, They went out from us. But get this. They were not of us. You see, see what he's doing there? They went out from us, meaning they were with us, they belonged to us, they stood with us, but they were not of us. They were not of our kind. They were not true. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Meaning there are some who will be with us and maybe go out from us, even though they were not of us. And what is this? It is a distinction that we often call the visible, invisible church distinction. Or as Paul would say, not all of Israel, and that is physical, visible Israel, is Israel, meaning belonging to the invisible elect save remnant who truly belong to Christ and then put that on display in their lives. So that's the distinction between the visible and the invisible church. The visible church is made up of all professing believers and their children, as we will see, who sometimes turn out not to be believers at all. While the invisible church is only ever made up of the elect, those who truly belong to Christ in a saving way. Meaning that you can belong to the physical and visible local church and not truly be converted. But you cannot belong to the invisible church and not be converted. Because it is exclusively made up of those who are elected, effectually called Regenerated, justified, sanctified, and will be glorified. And the Westminster Confession 25 affirms all of this and uses all the same language. It says this, 
It says the Catholic or universal church. It's not Rome, but universal, which is invisible, consists of the whole number of the elect that have been, are, or shall be gathered into one under Christ the head thereof. The visible church, which is also Catholic or universal, meaning in every place, consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion and of their children. Do you see the distinction? It's the same distinction summarized in the confession. The Catholic Church has been sometimes more, sometimes less visible, depending on numbers of professing Christians, suffering, all of those kinds of things. But then it says, and particular churches. See, you have global church, particular churches, visible church, the invisible church. He goes on to say, and particular churches, which are members thereof, meaning belonging to the universal church. It's not a different church altogether. One church manifested in different places are more or less pure according as the doctrine of the gospel as taught and embraced, ordinances administered and public worship performed more or less purely in them. So in the confession, all of the points that I brought up, the visible, invisible, local, and universal or Catholic realities are there. We have particular churches, those who profess Christ universally, and both of those are visible and physical. And you can see them and you can belong to them. And yet there is an invisible church within the local and global church, which is only made up of the elect and those who are effectually called, those who are, will be saved. And so we can see now why Voss says no to the question, is the church a simple thing to define. It is multifaceted. And depending on which angle you're looking at, the answer differs slightly. But the Reformed are in agreement with all these distinctions, whether you read Voss or Calvin, Bannerman, whoever it is, uh, and the confessional standard as I, as I showed us. And we have to make these distinctions. Because if we do not make these distinctions, we will not know what to do with elders. We will not know what to do with our children. We won't know how to function as a church unless we know what we are doing and how our church is defined in light of Scripture and in light of the other definitions that Scripture gives regarding the church. But now the question is this. When we talk about the church and we narrow it down to a body of people on earth who have leaders, the question is, who is really Lord over the church? If you ask Rome, you'll have a hard time dif distinguishing between the Pope and Christ himself. And so therefore, when we think about the church, the church invisible, the church visible, the church local, the church global, who reigns over this church on earth? And the answer, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, is that there is only one Lord who reigns over the church. There is only one master. There is only one kurios, and that is the Lord Jesus. And it does not matter whether it's the church global in every place. It does not matter whether it is the church invisible or visible. It doesn't matter whether it is the, the, a particular church like Redemption Life Bible Church. At every point, the only answer regarding the church and who reigns over her with absolute authority is Christ himself. He is master and he reigns over his church from heaven. He is Lord, and he will build and protect his church. And he says this, Matthew 16, 18. The Lord Jesus says, I will build my church. Catch that. My church. This is why 
I and lots of other pastors try not to say my church. We try not to ask each other, how are things going in your church? Now, we know what we mean. We mean the church you belong to, the church you shepherd, the church you care for and oversee and all of this stuff. But, but, but the reason that we are slow to say things are going well in my church is because we want to defend at all costs the fact that this is not my church and this is not your church. This is his church, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I will build my church. She belongs to me, thank you very much. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. And therefore, from heaven, from the highest heavens, Christ, as priest king, sits as supreme, as Lord and ruler over all of his people on earth, which we call the church. And what is fascinating to me, just another clue that this is true, is that Paul, who is an apostle, Paul, who is an apostle chosen by Christ, a man carried by the Spirit, who speaks for the Lord with the authority of the Lord. Not even the apostle Paul, who holds a most honorable and esteemed, extraordinary office, meaning it doesn't exist anymore in the sense that it did, over and above even a pastor or elder, which is an ordinary office. Not even this apostle Paul thought for a moment that he was Lord over the church. Christ is, and Paul knew it, and we must know it too. This is why he says, their Lord and ours. And he includes himself in those, even as an apostle, those who are ruled by the Lord Jesus from heaven. And not only does scripture call Christ Lord, supreme Lord in relation to the church, his people who are set apart in the world as those who are united to him, but scripture gives us even more images regarding his position to his church. Scripture teaches us that he is the chief shepherd and we are his flock. He is the good shepherd, the chief shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. He is husband, and we are the bride. He is a husband who died for his bride, that she might be saved and holy and pure. He is the head, and we are the body. Paul in Colossians 2.19 says, He is the head from whom the whole body, that includes her elders and overseers, shepherds, deacons, and all the servants in the church. He is head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. Or to use another biblical image, Christ is king over his kingdom of redemption, a kingdom in which there is forgiveness of sins, Colossians 1.13, a kingdom which is manifest in the world, in and through the church, his blood-bought people. And therefore, what I want us to see in regard to the church, local, global, Christ reigns as supreme from heaven over this people on earth by the Spirit. He is Lord, He is head, and there is no other. And it is only in light of these two realities, understanding the church and who she is and how she is defined, and who her Lord is, namely Christ, the King. It's only after we have understood these realities that are we prepared to understand her leaders. Christ, or the church, her Lord, and her leaders. And so now we move from the church through the Lord Jesus who reigns as supreme. And now I want to introduce the idea of the leaders of the church. And when we talk about leaders in the church, we are now talking usually about leaders who lead and rule over a particular local church like Redemption Life Bible Church. 
Now, I know that I am jumping to elders, but it is important for us to understand that as the story of Scripture unfolds, there are offices that come before elder, that exist and, and later give way to the office of elder. And here's what I mean. Is that when Christ came, he did not choose 12 elders. He chose 12 apostles. An inspired envoy who planted and oversaw churches. They were with him. They saw him. They heard him. They were eyewitnesses of his life, death, and resurrection. And these inspired apostles and their helpers, who are the evangelists in Scripture, as they began to pass away, as these offices began to pass away, the oversight and the care for the church, the teaching of the church, the leadership of the church, is given to mature, godly, theologically sound men who are called elders. So there is a transitionary period. As the apostles die out, as their helpers, the evangelists, die out, you see this transition from apostolic authority ultimately into the hands of the elders whose authority is rooted in the word of Christ and Christ himself. But we see this, for example, in Acts 14, 23. It says, and when they, that is Paul, an apostle and Barnabas, had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So you can see the beginning of the transition there. That after the churches have been planted in Acts, Paul and Barnabas go back through and they establish in those churches elders who will do what elders do, as we will see later. And not only do we begin to see a plurality of elders established in the opening parts of, of Acts, as we see this transition happening, but there are little clues in Acts as to what the elders are going to be responsible to do. And we see a clue of that in Acts 20, one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture. In fact, my very first sermon here as pastor was preached on Acts 20, if you remember. And most of you probably don't because you weren't here. <laughs> most of those who would are gone. That's great. Anyways, I preached a sermon called A Beginning with the End in Mind from Acts 20. I love this section of scripture. Paul, it says this, Acts 20, 17. Now from Miletus, he, that is Paul, sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. So they've been established to come to him. And after a series of biographical comments about Paul and his life and his model before them, this is what he says to them in, in verse 26 and following. He says, therefore... I testify you to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. That's an allusion to Ezekiel 3. And why can he say that? For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And then listen to what he says to these elders who have been summoned to him before he leaves them forever. He says, pay careful attention to yourselves, elders, and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. That's what elders are to be and are to do. And while this will be later clarified and expounded on in the pastoral epistles, like First and Second Timothy, Titus. Here in Acts 20, we get a glimpse of what the elders are to be and do in relationship to the, the church over which Christ reigns as supreme. The elders are to pay careful attention, to have a watchful eye for themselves, but not just for themselves, but for the flock. Which means that elders are shepherds, overseers, watchmen, caring for the church, 
which has been bought by the precious blood of the Lamb, who is Jesus Christ. Do you understand how horrifying that is? You can go to a museum in Washington, D.C. and see some archaic, fascinating piece of history in bulletproof glass, surrounded by armed guards who are to protect that with their life. And I want you to know something. Whatever that is, however glorious it is and however beautiful, however historical, it is nothing, absolutely nothing in comparison to the blood-bought bride of Christ. And any elder who does not understand that is not worthy of the office. And I want you to know that oftentimes I forget that. Did I just disqualify myself? I don't know. The point is the precious reality of the church of Christ and the job of the elders who exist to oversee and shepherd and care for it and watch over this bride watching over her doctrine, making sure that she is being washed in the word of Christ, watching over her life and protecting her from wolves who are to be caught and shot. Not literally. Although if you're a theonomist, Sorry, friends. Elders are to watch over her life, protecting her, watching over enemies who are on the outside, watching over her and protecting her from enemies and even sin that is like leaven on the inside that can corrupt the entire loaf in a short period. Elders who are to oversee and care and shepherd her, leading her through suffering and even death, Elders, shepherds, overseers, in one sense, are the church fathers. Church fathers, city fathers, and house fathers. And what do fathers do? They love and they care for those in their house. And they protect them from all harm as they are able. And when I think about our church right now, and who should be an elder? One who protects the church doctrinally and will protect the church doctrinally, one who teaches biblical truth on a regular basis, one who will help watch over and protect and lead the sheep in paths of righteousness. I don't know about you, but the man that comes to my mind immediately is Sam Frost. One of my pastor friends, Andrew Dion, he belongs to Evangel Presbytery. But he wrote this. He said, the sheep need eager shepherds committed to their souls. Shepherds who are committed to their well-being. Shepherds who care about the sheep among them. Shepherds who are committed to the daily feeding of their own sheep. And who are standing in the gap where the battle rages most fiercely to their own hurt. Meaning, 
that to be a shepherd is to risk being bit by the sheep. And any shepherd knows what it is to be bit by the sheep. He goes on to say, we don't need those who aspire to greatness. We don't need worldly, ambitious men. We don't need the wealthy and the well-positioned. We don't need those that are vain and incapable of self-examination. We don't need cowards and panderers. We need men filled with the Spirit who are not arrogant, godly men who want to shepherd the sheep. And I am convinced that Sam Frost is that kind of man. And I think that many of you who have sat under his Tuesday teaching, his occasional Sunday preaching, and if you have spent any time with him at all, any time at all, and you should, you will know that he is a theologically astute and yet pastorally sensitive shepherd candidate. So as we close, I want you to be thinking about Sam as an elder candidate. I want you to be thinking about his life, his doctrine. I want you to be talking to him. And I don't mean take a list of questions to him. Just get to know him. Have coffee with him. I want you to know that he aspires to this office, and he has for a while. He is eagerly excited and willing to serve and to help and to teach and to help shepherd you. And I think he is qualified for it. In fact, I think he is way more qualified than I am for it. And although he feels the internal call of the Spirit, which Paul calls aspiring to the office, and although I agree with him, the church has to affirm that internal call with an external call, which happens here through our voting. Which means Sam cannot just jump on board as an elder because he feels like it. But you must see from the outside that he is qualified, that he is a good candidate, and you must affirm his internal desire by confirming it with your acceptance. You must, through voting, either show your support and willingness to be led and fed and protected by Sam, trusting him as a shepherd, even if you disagree with him on certain points. Because we, none of us, agree perfectly. The point is not to find someone that you agree with in every dot and tittle. The point is, does he meet the qualifications? That's the point, according to Scripture. And so you must affirm it through voting or you can reject my recommendation by voting no. And I want to do that vote in the near future. Uh, I sent out an email about next week doing a question and answer session after the service, uh, but then I realized it's Mother's Day. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, Mother's. It's the Lord's Day first. But uh, No, I, but I know that people oftentimes have plans after church with their mothers and families, and I don't want to get in the way of that. That's not going to be good for Sam. Uh, yeah. So let's start off like that. Um, so let's, let's just say um, that we want to have a question and answer session after a service very soon so that you can ask Sam whatever questions you want. If you don't feel comfortable asking him the questions, give them to me and I will ask him um, publicly, not just face-to-face and quiet, but publicly at that meeting. And then it seems to me that in that same meeting, after we ask, uh, there's no reason that we cannot just vote after that meeting, after we've asked the questions and heard the answers. Um, And if you disagree, feel free to let me know. We can work that out. Uh, But in the near future, within the next month or so, depending on schedules and timing and, and what's going on, I would like to have... Uh, Sam at the Q&A session. I want to hear all your questions, your thoughts. I want to hear his answers, which I already know what they will be, pretty much. Um, And then I want to vote, and after we vote, if you affirm it, uh, I will preach a sermon, and we will have an ordination Sunday in which we uh, ordain him and install him as an elder here at Redemption Life uh, Bible Church. So be watching for emails, announcements, all that regarding that process. In the meantime, be praying for Sam, And be praying for Kim. Don't forget her. She's awesome. And pray for our church 
that the will of the Lord will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Otherwise, we would be groping in the dark at every point. We wouldn't know what to believe, what to think, how to live. We would have no hope. We would have no guidance. We would just be miserable. And yet, in your kindness, not only have you saved us, not only have you given general revelation in the world and trees and the sun and the moon, all of which declare your glory, but you have given us your written word that we can have in our hands in this country, that we can read every day, that we can study and, and love and cherish. And Lord, in your kindness, you have given us those who teach us and better help us understand what your word is which is sometimes complicated, what it means and how it applies to our church as a body and how it applies to our individual lives as Christians. And Lord, we thank you for giving us Sam. We thank you for bringing him here. Sam and Kim and his mother. We thank you for all of, of them, their whole family. And Lord, we pray that, that you would lead and guide this process, that your will would be done and that you would take RLBC into greater places, not for our glory, but for your own namesake, for our joy as we watch it happen. Pray this all in Jesus' name and all God's people said.